welcome to Enchantment of Eternities, a review for Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 12, Species 10C. This video is part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Star Trek Discovery, so I have to start with a spoiler warning for Discovery up to Season 4, Episode 12. If you have not seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video, otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. Now, I've said before, and I, I've said this last week, that the season kind of stretched on for too long and that seems to be a very common opinion that uh that the season didn't need to be <laughs> as long as it did and then maybe because they stretched it out it kind of lost some uh lost some people uh, some interest in the, the uh, storyline of the season however i will say that this is the storyline has finally kicked in now granted i still feel like they could have gotten there a lot quicker but um, it's a great setup. This is a great penultimate episode. It has me, I really enjoyed it. It has me really excited for the finale. Um, yeah, I just thought this was really good. Now, there were some contrivances in this episode that I'll get to that kind of annoyed me, but didn't overall shake my, um, interest in this episode, which I thought was really good. So basically, Discovery arrives at this weird, there's this weird bubble thingy that they can't penetrate, and so they attempt to um, communicate with Species 10C. Now, they've been trying to send out this message, and uh, Burnham's like, you know what, I think we need to do the contingency plan, dun, dun, dun. The president's like, oh no, not the contingency plan. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> well, no, she was like, well, can't we just try communicating furthermore? Do we really need to resort to that contingency plan? And Burnham's like, well, I, they would have responded by now. And so I'm like, ooh, what is this contingency plan? Is it dangerous? Like, what does it involve? Like, ooh, what is it? But it's just sending a bunch of dots in to spray the, you know, the emotion pheromones or whatever. And I'm like... Really? You were, why didn't you just do that in the first place? Why Why is that a contingency plan? Like, why is the president so, oh, I don't know about that. Like, why not? Why didn't you just do that to begin with? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, all the dots that I got eaten up, they didn't, they, the poor dots, I wonder if they consider them sentient or not because they just, like, sacrificed them all. I'm like, woo, they kind of remind me exocomps. Anyway, maybe they'll get the dots back. <laughs> because they still be floating around somewhere in that thing. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they do get species at uh, 10 C's attention, and so they want to grab Discovery and bring it in, and they were all freaking out, like, oh, I can't get it in. And I kind of, yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like they they should, like, want to go in but maybe they interpret that as like a hostile act in there i don't know i feel like burnham's kind of overreacted to it i was like red alert like their ship was about to be destroyed but i don't know maybe they did maybe they thought that was a wave that was trying to destroy the ship i don't know but turns out they it just pulled them in and they started communicating and we see like that uh, uh, linguist guy who I like. It's, I like this character, but I thought it, I didn't mention this last week's episode. I thought it was a bit silly how the president was like, "You need to tone it down." Like I don't know. I'd rather he not. <laughs> Plus, that whole scene felt a bit. I don't know. It felt a bit awkward. Like it didn't feel like. Um, didn't like it. Anyway, we're, that's last week's episode. So regardless, I, I love this character and he's there and they're trying to communicate and they, they do all the sort of, uh, you know, trying to patterns and stuff. I did think it was a bit silly hell. They called the bridge crew down to get their opinion on like, and they started feeding off of each other and be like, oh, we did this and we did this and we did that. Blah, blah. Like you got trained linguists and diplomats and you have to have bridge officers figure this shit out for you. But I suppose the point is that they needed a fresh perspective and it was different people's experiences that helped build to it. So it was fine. Um, and so I really love like this whole sequence though, um, where they slowly figuring out how to communicate with species 10 C. It reminded me a lot of, uh, that movie arrival, uh, especially when species 10 C finally showed up 
Like, you couldn't see it very... It was like a blur of, like, all the, you know, CGI stuff, and I could, it could kind of make out the form. But you could see, like, uh, the linguist dude had, like, displays of what they looked like, and they kind of looked like the Arrival aliens. I don't know. Maybe I'm just... Maybe they don't at all, and I'm just thinking that because this 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 scene is the what they're doing is so much like that movie, which it I have no doubt that the writers took heavily heavy influence from that movie, but I, it's fine. I got no issues with that because it's actually kind of cool to uh, integrate that kind of thing because that isn't something that Star Trek usually do. Usually they have the Universal Translator, and you know the Universal Translator was originally created to, because they're too lazy <laughs> to try to deal with language barriers and be like, oh, here's an end awesome magic device that can just fix language barriers immediately. Um, now, granted, um, Star Trek tried to play with, I mean, they did try to play with it in the episode Darmok, but that language actually didn't make any sense so in my opinion it actually failed still a good episode i just don't maybe not as great as some some people say that it is but i still really love it but anyway um and an enterprise you know because they had less technology universal translator wasn't a magical device back then it wasn't perfect so you needed hoshi to interpret everything so in that way they actually started playing with actual languages Whereas, of course, in the original series, TNG, they just don't want to fuck with it. It's like, oh, let's have a magical device that automatically has aliens speak English. Uh, <laughs> um, but, and so here, it, it does seem kind of... I do buy it that the universe translate because these aliens are totally different than anything the Federation's ever encountered before, which it should be because they're in another freaking galaxy. And I also, that also alleviates my concerns I had last week that I, I kind of knew that the show wouldn't do this, but I was like, the show better not have like some, you know, human looking aliens with bumps on their forehead and show up in B Species 10C. But from the way they were building up to it and what this kind of special effects discovery has had and illustrated, I kind of knew that they wouldn't do that. And so I'm very relieved and very happy with the look of Tennessee. As I said, maybe they did were influenced by the movie Arrival, but they still, I love how it's totally different. And so this is, is kind of, I think, a new thing for them to, for Star Trek, that is, for the saga to um, have to try to communicate with aliens by using mathematics and stuff like that. But it's, it feels very Star Trek-like, the way that they do it. And so I absolutely love this whole storyline. I love like the interactions between the various characters, like the Colonel from Earth and the Vulcan um, Chancellor, President of Navarre, whatever her name was, and and Saru and and Burnham and and the Federation President. How they all have their different sort of hangups, and and the linguist dude, and they all have their. Uh, different ways of dealing with this like I thought all those interactions were great I actually love how they threw in this thing about Saru not like acting all weird with the <laughs> the Vulcan lady saying because the, he's interested in her but then Burnham explains like the cultural context behind uh, well, how Vulcans don't really like to interact professionally with those they have feelings for. And that made a lot of sense for Sir, but they even said, like, oh, thanks for the cultural context. And it sort of, it feeds into the, um, the whole theme of the communication, that cultural context is very helpful. Uh, and so that they need to understand the cultural context behind uh, Species 10C. And then they had to sp finally start to communicate with them. They sent this little bubble thingy <laughs> for them to go in. So some of them went in and um, were, you know, carried off to the magical land to communicate. And this, this scene I actually did love where, I love this whole thing. Like, it does remind me of a lot of, like sci-fi the, the having to communicate with aliens because i love how they recreated the discovery bridge because that's what they're familiar with and uh the uh, the whole thing of how they got they came up with this mathematical equation to represent humans or represent you know not just humans but of course all the federation species and um and then had the the dma and then added the fear icon, and they sort of, 
I love that. I thought that was great. And that's what gave Species 10C um, was telling them, like, look, your DMA is, is destroying us. And then, so they came back with, like, the, the sad um, sort of uh, emotional thing saying that oh no you know we didn't know this and, and we're, that makes us sad that, that, that this is doing this to you and so they're in a really good place and that's right when Tarka fucks up because I mean to be fair and I'm not saying this is a knock on the episode but obviously this is um, television this is storytelling this is fiction you can't just have everything go perfectly swimmingly you have to throw a monkey wrench any good narrative structure has to have setbacks although i will say this one is maybe a bit more contrived <laughs> because it, it, it has i'm watching it because as you're watching a piece of fiction you don't want to be like oh there's the setback that that the, the narrative needs in order to throw an issue you just want to be immersed in the story whereas here it was kind of jarring where i was like yeah they have to have something to fuck kind of fuck things up because everything can't go perfect um, but, you know, to be fair, they've been building Tarka up for this all season for this. Um, now let's get into the Tarka book thing. And that's kind of where my issues with contrivances come in. Because I don't feel like Tarka should have been able to do what he did in this episode. Uh, but he needed to for narrative purposes because he needs to be the huge threat, threat in the finale. He need, needs to threaten everything. But first of all... It's kind of annoying how they had the subplot with Zora and Colbert and Zora's like, oh, something feels off, and, and they're trying to figure it out. And just coincidentally, lucky for the plot, they don't figure it out until it's too late. And so what, what kind of what was the point is a bit frustrating to watch because you're like, come on, Zora, figure it out. And then by the time she figures it out, Tarker's already enacted his plan and it's too late. And so it's just like... That's frustrating, <laughs> but again, they have to do it for the plot because they need to have a threat next week. Uh, and um, then there's also, like, I don't buy that Tarka was able to defeat Book as easily as it did. As Book said, this, that was his ship, and why would Book keep attacking him when he knows that Tarka has created this energy field that's going to hurt him every time he tries to attack uh, Tarka, that he could have come up with some other way to circumvent Tarka. Uh, and the fact that he was able to come up with this magically in, in magical energy field on book ship, yeah, I'm a bit dubious about that as well. So, I don't know. That kind of bothered me. And, of course, Jet and Reno, the whole time she was, like, fucking around with the licorice. <laughs> I love Jet and Reno. I love the whole thing, how she's just chewing on her licorice, but, of course, she's using it to... Now, I love, like, she had did the... I was going to say Mr. Wizard, but it was almost like a MacGyver, where she's like, oh, the juices and licorice can actually activate this communicator, which I don't really buy, but, hey, I love it, so it's all good. Um... But I'm uh, frustrated again that she didn't do it in time um, because Book's code was in the way. But I think it did in, make for a really, really exciting ending when we see when we hear her message, and um, and she tells like Discovery like what Tark is gonna do and how it could destroy, kill, not only just kill all of them, completely destroy the relationship with Ten C, uh, probably you know, harm 10C as well, but also um, harm Earth and the, the whole point was to stop them. And so I guess this is where it's necessary for Tarka's storyline about wanting the energy source comes in because he doesn't really care about Earth and Navarre. He just wants to get to his other universe. Um, but I still don't see him as a mustache twirly villain. I do think as adversaries go, he's definitely the best uh, the most dynamic, I shall say, that Discovery has ever had because Discovery is quite notorious for having two-dimensional mustache twirly villains, not just last season, but previous seasons as well. Like, Control was kind of eh, and what they did with Lorca, making him evil mirror, it was kind of eh as well. So, <laughs> I, so I think he is definitely a step up from adversaries that Discovery has had before, and I think this is a... I do like that the Ten C didn't turn out to be these big mustache twirly villains, and that Tark himself is 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 not a mustache twirly villain. But he's it turned out that he was the adversary or the nemesis of the whole season, which I didn't know. I like I didn't guess when we first introduced him that he would be like the the main 
emissary. Uh, so I, I think that's an extremely dynamic storytelling. I think that's a huge improvement of what Discovery has done uh, before. Um, so I did really appreciate that. But, yeah, I don't think he should have been able to do what he did this episode. He shouldn't have won, but of course they need to have a threat. So contrivances, but whatever. Um, the, yeah, that message that Jet Reno gave at the end was extremely, like, intense like and they had a actually you know i i've always complained about the cinematography in this show and the, whoever did it for this episode i actually really appreciate it. i like it like i think i noticed it right away as being really stylistic and sort of helping the story i was like hey this is actually they don't do the bullshit where this camera is spinning around and they have the lens flyer they do they were doing more close-ups and and i love how they actually did well it doesn't do the spinning thing but it kind of spins around towards the end to focus on burnham when she realized when she hears jet reno's message and they play that suspense so, music that and they cut the black like that was very effective for me i, I did really much uh, appreciate that and i'm really excited now i think my faith is not 100% because Discovery does have a uh, history of fucking things up that could have been great, or at least making it mixed or so-so instead of great, but if they play their cards right, this finale could be great. This could be an amazing finale, but maybe they won't play their cards right and be like the disappointment of the burn last season. So I don't have complete faith that, that it will be an amazing finale, but I think it definitely could. And so there's part of me that's hoping they actually manage to freaking pull it off this time. I mean, because there's a whole setup at the start of the season about uh, the president saying to Burnham that she doesn't, you know, she cares too much. She doesn't know what it means to sacrifice someone, and she tries too hard to to save everyone you can't always do that and that's actually as i mentioned before that's a reoccurring theme we've seen uh with her throughout the show and so if they're managed to pull that off in a way where she does have to sacrifice someone i think that would be amazing now i kind of think it's going to be jet reno i kind of get the impression uh because she was barely in the season and now she's in this dangerous situation. I get the impression the actress doesn't, may, maybe doesn't want to do the show anymore. <laughs> and so she's going to be... Uh, although uh, the other person I think it might be interesting would be Book. Uh, of course, because uh, having to sacrifice um, her lover. But I, I kind of doubt that because they've already had that tension between the two of them. Plus, I don't think they want to write that guy off the show. But that's just my guess. So anyway, my rating for Species 10C out of 10 is a 9. Excellent. I, I did think this was, uh, I had my gripes with this episode, but overall, an amazing episode. I, I love the character interactions. The dialogue was smart. The cinematography was good. I love how the, the whole aspect of trying to communicate with these weird aliens is Star Trek. It's new to Star Trek, yet Star Trek is so something that I really, really appreciate as a Star Trek fan. Uh, so, and it plus is a great, it's very effective in building up, building excitement, building up interest for the finale, which I hope does not end up being a massive disappointment because Discovery, you burned me too many times. But hopefully your change show. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. So anyway, that is it for my review of this latest episode of Discovery. I, of course, will be back next week to cover the finale, as well as covering Star Trek Picard on a weekly basis, as well as other shows such as The Expanse, all things Star Trek and Star Wars The Clone Wars, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.